Who's counting on me? When we look and we can see Things are not what they should be Who's counting on me? Who's counting on you? A little later, Dean Freudenberger is going to be part of the program. He was my uh, professor when I came on sabbatical back in the mid-70s to the School of Theology here in Claremont, and I wasn't, I was just going to loaf, kind of, and take a Cobb course or two. And uh, the first uh, speech for all concerned uh, at the seminary 
was uh, hunger and uh, responsible, our responsibility in a hungry world. And uh, this guy named Dean Freudenhausen or something was the speaker, and it was so compelling that I had to take his class. And this uh, song uh, I wrote later based on his book, uh, Global Dust Bowl. I walk the road in a sultry wind. Please sing as it becomes familiar to you. Where the corn should grow, but the crop was thin. I'd fertilized well, as I'd done for years. But the wheat stalks held only stunted ears. As I racked my brain, what the blind could be. A villager came and spoke to me. Go into the forest, see what it teaches. Down on your knees where the dark soul preaches. Appreciate the sun and the wind and the rain. So the seeds come up again and again. Everybody now. So I tramped in. conference that um, when we were working on the CD the night before, 
thought I needed something more personal to express my own reluctance to get on board because it's so easy to keep that out there. And this song is called Come Old Pilgrim. become familiar to you, whether it says solo on the screen or not. Come, old pilgrim, walk with me into a world we dimly see. The tide has turned, the tempest blow, the tipping point is past we know. Though we were not the masters, robber bearers, Come on, pilgrim, hold my hand. Stumble toward a savage land. We took our comfort, even knowing winds of greed were forever flowing. But the Holy One goes with us, a calling wise and deep. With abundance we have flourished, now we must do with less. So the young ones may be nourished with peace and gentleness. So come, old pilgrim, walk beside into a future wild. John Stewart, not the uh, TV humorist, but the uh, later addition to the Kingston Trio, went out on his own and in the mid-1970s, he had a song called Cheyenne. But the line that I remember best of all is this one. Never had a job where the boss didn't steal the bass drum from his own brass band. That's what we're doing to the band of the world. We're stealing. And we have considered ourselves the bosses. And we're here because we know a new paradigm is developing. Let's hope we're in time with it. your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. Take, take off your shoes, you're standing on holy ground. The earth is our gods and the fullness thereof, from the waters beneath to the heavens above. So take, take, take off your shoes, oh yeah, cause you're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. On the eighth day of creation, while well, our God was around, at the power plants and freeways and the trash of the ground, plantations growing rubber where the grain should be high. You couldn't see 
need a sun for all the smog in the sky. Well, kids, you really filled the earth with and you so do. But there's nothing in my book that says you've got to pollute it. So take, take off your shoes. Cause you're standing on my holy ground. You're standing on my holy ground. You're heating up the planet with your greenhouse effect. What's the word now? Global what? Global warming? Global warming. Do you not understand? It's worth the commodity we're looking for. It's time to learn the sanity that what is for. Everybody, take off your shoes. morning and good future to you because we gather in this last plenary to ground ourselves in music and in the land what a bet what a better way to conclude a conference like this I'm Mary Elizabeth Moore Dean of Boston University School of Theology I welcome you to this session and I in introduce you to someone who is the miracle man who's kept all of the wheels turning and who will share with us the final announcements of the conference as well as um, introduce us to Ignacio Castuera who has a special announcement to make. Thank you. Good morning. Wow, that was very responsive. Okay. Well, I'd first want to um, throw out a quick thank you and acknowledgement to Pomona College and the amazing, amazing staff and help that we have here. We have Kurt and Sharon and the Bridges crew and everybody here. It's been absolutely phenomenal. We couldn't have done any of this without them. Uh, Jan O'Neill and her crew, Trevor. Um, I want to throw a thank you for the Center for Process Studies staff. Um, I don't know if you've met uh, Rob and Ben and Leah running around here. Uh, at the registration table, the bookstore, all of that stuff has been uh, organized uh, with, their, with their hard work. Uh, and all of our volunteers, if anybody here has been using shuttle transportation, vans, or golf carts, you have a big thank you to give to Dick Tipping, who arranged all of that for us. Um, absolutely. And, uh, and John Forney, who helped us arrange all of our homestays off-site, uh, Jean Petillier, who's backstage over here, uh, operating all of this magnificence. So, uh, thank you to you all. Now to business. Uh, a few fun little announcements. Uh, one, the bookstore, which will continue to be open until about 5.30 this evening, does have free tote bags celebrating the Pilgrim Place Centennial. And these tote bags look great with the new purchase of a book. So please check out the bookstore over at the Smith Campus Center Ballroom. Uh, the banquet is tonight, 6 o'clock, Bixby Plaza, just over there by Frary Dining Hall in the Sontag Pomona dorms. Uh, if you have a ticket, please be there, and be there promptly. We uh, have a very tight program, and we need to be seated and ready to eat about by 6 o'clock. Um, some of you have asked about attire. Um, we're at a conference. Conference attire is acceptable, so whatever you're wearing now should be good to go. Um, Post-conference meetings, we will have um, meetings for track organizers and section organizers tomorrow, uh, Monday, 
over at Claremont School of Theology. Uh, track organizers will be meeting as a section starting at 9 a.m. Uh, locations can be found on our website under detailed schedule. Uh, and 1 p.m., the section organizers will get together and meet um, to discuss what the track organizers got together to meet. Um, this is our way of integrating the very diverse conference that we've had in these last few days, thinking about ways forward, publications, and how to continue to save the world. There are several track changes today that we need to be aware of. There's actually probably many more that I'm not aware of, but these two will be helpful to know. Section 4, track 1, telling the story, is not meeting today. So if you go to Mason, I think it's 001, uh, there should not be anybody there. Um, as well as section 11, track 5, end of life. This too will not be meeting today. <laughs> That's actually a true story. So. <laughs> uh, I, um, airport shuttles. The conference is not uh, arranging airport transportation, but we do have a message board out over in the Smith Campus Center area where you can try to carpool and make arrangements. Um, you can order cabs or airport shuttles from the Super Shuttle uh, program, and there's a link for that uh, with a discount on our website under travel information. A few other important details. For people who are traveling and you don't want to carry around your luggage all day, you're welcome to store that in our bookstore. There's plenty of space, but it's also limited. So. Uh, if 1,500 people decide to put their luggage in there, uh, we'll be in trouble. First come, first served. It's probably a good policy. Um, and finally, if you are staying on campus, we gave you a key, and we need it back. Uh, otherwise, we will be charging you a $100 fee. More correctly, Pomona College will be charging us, and then we'll be charging you. And since you registered, we know where you live. Um, Dining hall, if you've been received a meal card, um, which looks a lot like the little key card access for the dorms, um, those can be delivered uh, at the dining halls, returned upon your final meal, or you can hand it to a volunteer or up to the registration desk, wherever you like. Um, back to mention that the, the dorm procedures for checking out. Hopefully you've seen the signs, but if you haven't, there are places to put envelopes and keys uh, with your name and all that kind of information at the dorms, both Pomona Hall, um, Sontag, and, and down at Mud Blaisdell. Uh, if you've got keys for Pitzer College, uh, please contact one of your dorm hosts or any of the volunteers and we'll collect your key and take care of it. Uh, now I invite Ignacio up here to give us a, a new announcement. Thank you. <laughs> Salam Aleikum. Buenos dias. Good morning. Um, is uh, Chris Daniels in the house? Um, Chris, are you? Okay, well then, I, um, part of the reason I wanted that is I don't have the specific name of the person that, about whom I going, I'm going to speak. I was hoping that he was going to be here and that while he was making his way, I could just make a tiny comment on what, on, on what um, <clears throat> Andrew just said about the meetings that are going to go on tomorrow. Uh, beginning in Krakow, I began to, uh, I heard complaints about the way in which the conference was being organized. And even recently, I heard some of them in terms of how many silos, the tw that the 12 sections become silos. They are not. If you have read anything about Whitehead's theory of education, you, you need to realize that first is the romance, right? It's my favorite. Right? That's, that, that's the, first, the, fast, the first phase, the, the seduction or romancing. Now, then, the, you go to precision, and that's what we're doing here. It, we're not siloing, or whatever the verb for that is. We're not in silos. We're doing the precise work that needs to be done. And then, beginning tomorrow, the, the rest of us, and hopefully some of you will also be helping, will be doing the generalization. So this thoroughly Whiteheadian in that case. So um, the, the, what I'm sharing with you, and I'm sorry I do not have the name, uh, Chris Daniels has one of the most interesting tracks, and that is the indigenous tracks. And he and his wife, Jackie, went all over the world, literally by uh, phone in some instances, but Jackie actually has excellent relations with shamans in Siberia. Well, there's something about the fact that one of those shamans came to the United States and something hit him that then 
provoked some, something else that he already had inside of him and his appendix burst. That would alone be a reason for concern. But also, let us not forget that if this had happened in England, uh, we would be just saying, you know, it's going to be taken care of, even though he's from Siberia. Siberia. Uh, in this case, we do not know at this time even how we're going to take care of that bill. We don't even know what that bill will be. So some of you might be receiving some um, uh, thing from me or from Andrew or from John Cobb, you know, to uh, help us defray the cost of that. In the meantime, this being a Sunday, I ask you to uh, take a few seconds, but we're not going to take a full minute, and however you relate to uh, other people in terms of healing, um, I understand perfectly well the allergy to religion. I'm personally very allergic to religion. Um, <clears throat> so if you pray, pray. If you send vibrations, okay, if you do pixie dust, as one of my friends do, please send all of that in the direction of this gentleman whom we do not know, but who has been part of our family here. He's part of our Pando family, our emerging spiritual philosophical Pando family. So let's just take a few seconds. Amen. Namaste. Have a great day. Thank you, Ignacio, for reminding us of our presence together as a human community in an earth community. And that community makes all the difference. I have the pleasure now to introduce you to Brian Savage, who is an associate for development and logistics with the World Parliament of uh, the, the Parliament of World Religions. In this role, he gathers faith communities into work in the public square for the furthering of justice, peace, and sustainability. Brian received his earliest education in a farm community among the people who reared him and loved him into life. Now he lives in Chicago with his husband, Lauren, and two horrible cats. Thank you, Dr. Moore. And good morning. It is my profound honor to be here this morning to offer a welcome on behalf of the Parliament of the World's Religions, where you can continue this conversation in October in Salt Lake City at our Reclaiming the Heart of Our Humanity 2015 Parliament. Join thousands of others. You can register at parliamentofreligions.org for a $150 discount with the promotion code PANDO. Now that that is out of the way, PANDO all caps, by the way, that is important. I want to echo all of the gratitude that's been shared on this stage to John Cobb, to Andrew, to the many speakers, my goodness gracious, to the staff uh, who have helped me personally, Rob, Ben, Chase, everyone else uh, who has already been mentioned. And an enormous thank you to the many supporters of the Parliament who are here at this conference right now. Former board chair, Bill Lesher, whom many of you know. Former board members, uh, Joseph Prabhu and Chris Peters. Current board member, Kusumita Pedersen. And our many friends uh, at the Southern California Committee for a Parliament of the World's Religions who keep the spirit and action of the Parliament alive here in Southern California. If you know them, Ruth Brody Sharon and her many, many friends who help with that, uh, talk with them about the parliament as well. <clears throat> so yes, it is an honor to be here. It's an honor and a danger. It is a danger for someone of such highly humble abilities and yet occasional high self-regard as well to receive an email from John Cobb offering an opportunity like this. It could make one feel more highly about oneself than one ought. But I am brought to right size when I stand in front of a room like this to consider the thousands, indeed likely the tens of thousands of years of cumulative action here in this audience, 
going about the sometimes seemingly Sisyphean task of moving us from the is to the ought to be, of planting, tending, nurturing, of, dare I say, sharing, though that might be frowned upon, the seeds of a new earth. So welcome, welcome to the dynamic power produced when this sort of passion, wisdom, commitment, and sheer force of will gather in this entangled, intertwined, interconnected, interbeing. Welcome to the hope that comes from the deep and enduring wells of our many faith traditions that gather us together. Welcome to the audacity to dream that maybe, just maybe, the transformation we seek may be, if not within our reach, at least able to be brushed with our outstretched fingertips. Welcome to the opportunity the opportunity to seize an alternative. Thank you, Brian. And now I have the precious, precious opportunity to introduce you to C. Dean Freudenberger, graduate of Boston University School of Theology, by the way. Former missionary focused on agriculture and development of rural community life. Professor Emeritus from Claremont School of Theology and Luther Theological Seminary in Ecology and Ethics. Author of many books, including the very influential Global Dust Bowl, the subtitle of that book refers us back to the first evening in our, conver in our questions that Marjorie Sue Hockey placed before us. The subtitle is this, Can We Stop the Destruction of the Land Before It's Too Late? That question still hangs over us. Dean Freudenberger's response to that question has always been to roll up his sleeves and do what he can. So he, in addition to being an inspirer of thousands of students and others over a number of years, he is a local transformer who plants trees and reshapes earth care everywhere he goes. Welcome, Dean. I have the honor of introducing my friend Wes Jackson, but before that I'll simply introduce the two panelists and myself who, who will respond to Wes uh, following his presentation. Our first uh, panelist will be uh, Professor Johan Schrodi. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Ecological Studies of the Chinese Academy of Governance. He is also vice president chair of the economic department of the uh, Chinese University uh, Academy of Governance. Professor Zhang is one of the leading figures who has been promoting the concept and the national policy of an ecological civilization. Our second panelist will be Dr. Christopher Shore. Uh, Christopher is the Chief Development Officer for World Vision. His office now is located in the United States after being overseas for many years. Uh, Christopher is also the Director of the Natural Environment and Climatic Issues Department of World Vision. He also works in microfinance. World Vision program of microfinance is now involved in 42 nations and has grown from a capital budget of 18 million to now $340 million of, of, in the lending profile. 
Much of his work also involves agricultural development in both East and West Africa. So we'll look forward to some good responses. Wes Jackson, an agronomist, an agriculturist, a plant geneticist. Terrestrial life is dependent upon three basic resources, air, water, and soil. These resources are now under tremendous stress. Annually, the, global, the loss of global topsoil is 1% per year, leaving us with a question, if this continues, where are we gonna be at the end of this century? More than 50 years ago, he's that old now, Wes Jackson, the founder and president of the Land Institute located in Salina, Kansas, recognized that conventional agriculture was in deep, deep trouble. Even on the best managed, he told me this story years ago, on the best managed farms of his Amish neighbors, soil continued to move down to the end of the furrows and beyond. Years and years ago, Jackson realized that there had to be an alternative to the wastefulness and the destructiveness of conventional agriculture. For the Land Institute, Jackson initiated a 50-year research agenda. It's gonna take us 50 years to figure out how this is gonna happen. The basic objective of the research is to understand the dynamics of natural systems. This is no simple task. The natural system surrounding the vast area of the Land Institute, that is the Kansas Prairie, is an incredible mix of deep-rooted prairie grasses. Jackson vision as a plant geneticist armed long ago with a PhD from the uh, North uh, Carolina State University, has been to develop food grains from these prairie grasses. 40 years, keep that in mind, 40 years after the founding of the Land Institute, bread and sweet rolls are being baked with kerns of grass. Wes brought me a little present for me and my wife uh, a bag of prairie grass flour that is a result of all of these years. I wish I could invite all of you to share uh, with this. This, this. There's a miracle in that bag. So with perennial grains, there's no more plowing, there's no more soil loss, there's no more chemical fertilizers, there's no more pesticides. Deep prairie grasses, the roots of these grasses run at least 12 feet into the ground, provide resilience and build soil. This represents the vision that we've all had of a sustainable and therefore regenerative alternative to wasteful and exhausting agriculture. Wes Jackson and his team of researchers, it's, it's an accomplishment that's hard to describe, but it's an illustration in this bag, it's an illustration of the alternative that we're all struggling to, uh, to achieve. Wes Jackson and his team of researchers have developed an ever-expanding network through several United States land-grant universities and around the world. Last year, for example, 48 plant, society, plant scientists from five continents gathered at Estes Park for a week of discussions concerning the international research agenda for the adaptation of perennial cropping systems that will be appropriate to the various ecosystems around the world. The objective is to build a post-conventional 
regenerative and therefore sustainable agriculture, the first time in 10,000 years. Jackson is working with others to establish a full-scale center for national uh, e uh, systems management, natural systems management. Jackson rece has received many, many honors including a MacArthur Genius Award in 1992, uh, recently the, the Right Livelihood Award, which is a so-called annual uh, Nobel Prize in, in the year 2000, and he's just recently received another honorary doctorate from the University of Kansas. He is also the author of many books and articles, including the groundbreaking book that I read many years ago that helped to change my understanding of my career, which was entitled New Roots for Agriculture, roots that have to be at least 12 feet into the ground. It's my great pleasure to present to you my friend and uh, my mentor, West Jackson. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, everybody, for uh, this particularly auspicious uh, gathering that is in the year of the soil, the United Nations, uh, as we all know through the FAO, has declared 2015 the year of the soil. So it's uh, uh, satisfying that uh, we would be having this particular forum uh, in this particular year. I want to go through a few basic facts. Soil is more important than oil. Amen. Number two, soil is as much of a non-renewable resource as oil. Now that first one is easy. Everybody knows soil is more important than oil, but as much of a non-renewable resource, well, I'm going to tell you a story. Mendocino County, north of San Francisco, about an hour and a half, Jug Handle State Park. I was on a field trip with the famous uh, soil scientist, Hans Jenny, several years ago, and there the Pacific plate is sliding under the continental plate and about every 100,000 years and for the past 500,000 years there's been a creation of five different terraces. In terrace one is a lot of redwood and dug fir. In terrace two, yes, redwood and dug fir. Terrace three, 300,000 years old, is a transition uh, zone where some Jeffreys uh, pine is coming in. Terrace four is a pygmy forest, and terrace five is an even more pygmy forest. If you were to weigh up the biomass at the edge of the ocean in terrace one and two, redwood, dud fir, it would weigh a lot within a, say, a square kilometer. Same thing in two. But by the time you get to the pygmy forest, the terraces are yielding much less biomass in four and five in the pygmy forest. So with probes, soil probes, soil scientists have gone down from the high terrace to the ocean and what they find is that the nutrients have been leaching downward over time. 
So the big question is, why are there not pygmy forests, pygmy prairies all over the world? And the reason is we have geologic activity. The uplift of the Rockies, the uplift of the Sierra Nevada, and the coastal range, coastal range Sierra Nevada gave us the Central Valley of California. It's geologic time that does it, and in the case of the Midwest, the nutrients scraped off the Canadian shield gave us the soy, soils of Illinois, Iowa, Indiana, the richest, most expansive soils of the world. Soil is as much of a non-renewable resource as oil. Australia is a poor continent and it's going to stay poor. Its last geologic activity is some 65 million years ago. I guess they did have a little volcano that doesn't amount to much lately. But the point being that it's the consequence of geologic activity. So when we find that we're building our soils in our backyard and we say that we are making our garden richer, it's likely the consequence of what I call an acceptable theft from somewhere uh, within the ecosphere. So with that behind, moving on, Chris Field, Carnegie Institute of Washington, Stanford University, a survey done around the world by him and his group. Chris Field found out, and it's published in Science 2002, that natural ecosystems generally have greater net primary production than the human managed systems that follow. Now we'll come back to this a little later. And then my late and my friend, the late Chuck Washburn, an engineer trained in metallurgy, Chuck said to me once, if we don't get sustainability in agriculture first, it's not going to happen. Agriculture ultimately will have standing behind it a discipline. It's called ecology and evolutionary biology. And Chuck went on. The materials sector has no discipline to call on. So here we have soil is more important than oil, as much of a non-renewable resource as oil, and natural ecosystems generally have greater net primary production, and ecology and evolutionary biology stand behind the potential for the materials sector uh, to um, uh, to begin to get the message of what will be necessary for a sustainable future. Moving on, land use is number two as a source of greenhouse gases behind power plants and head of all transportation. Subtract off the deforestation in the tropics and that which is for the allocation of agriculture, usually grain agriculture, corn and soybeans, uh, it's about equal to all transportation. And finally, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report said some time ago, agriculture is the greatest threat to wild biodiversity. So let's, um, let's start with a basic food fact. 70 to 75 percent of our acreage worldwide, as well as here in the United States, is devoted to the source of some 70 percent of our calories, and they come from the grains, grasses, legumes, and members of the sunflower family, uh, primarily as oilseed crops. 70% of our calories come from grains and about 70% of our acreage. So some years ago, uh, Dean already alluded to it, uh, we set out on the journey 
to solve the 10,000-year-old problem of agriculture, which is that all of our grains are annuals, most of them grown in monocultures, which means you have to tear the ground up every year. And it's in 1977 when I looked at the General Accounting Office study at the efficacy of soil, uh, of the money being spent uh, on um, uh, stopping soil erosion, and it looked to me like it was as bad in the 70s as when it was in the 30s. But I took my students on a field trip to the Kanza Prairie in Kansas. Thousands of acres have never plowed prairie, and here was a system no fossil fuel input, no introduction of chemicals with which our tissues have no evolutionary experience. Here was a system with essentially no soil erosion beyond natural replacement levels. Here was a system that um, uh, seemed sustainable, and especially when one compared it to the surrounding agricultural acreage growing the corn, the wheat, the soybeans, sorghum, and so on. So <clears throat> I wondered, is agriculture in the nature of a, tra of, a, of a tragedy, a dramatic tragedy? I'd read a little of Whitehead. <clears throat> Whitehead said that the essence of dramatic tragedy lies not in unhappiness, but in the remorseless, inevitable working of things. And so is agriculture in the nature of a dramatic tragedy. We have to eat, and yet the grains uh, growth is undercut, undercutting the very basis of our own existence. Well, uh, so we then set off to see, look into the possibility of building an agriculture based on the prairie, but that would produce grains, which means perennial mixtures or perennial uh, polycultures. Let's see, I'm trying to get the slide to show here. Whoops. Well, there's Whitehead and Darwin, two of my heroes along with John Cobb. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, <clears throat> the um, if we look at the inventory, of the crops <clears throat> that um, uh, that humans have, there are all the possible combinations filled uh, when we consider uh, some uh, four different categories. You can be uh, there can be uh, we grow some of our crops in um, monocultures and some in polycultures. We grow some and, um, uh, that are woody and some that are herbaceous. We have some that are annual, some that are perennial, and there are 12 rational combinations. 11 of those combinations are filled, all except the one there at the bottom, a polyculture of herbaceous perennials for fruit seed. And so that blank uh, just um, speaks to us to raise the question, why have our ancestors not developed perennial grains? And I'm going to tell you about uh, some good news on that um, in a moment. When <clears throat> I first uh, uh, published on this, it was in 78, I said this is gonna take 50 to 100 years in fact, our motto is, if you're working on something you can finish in your lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. Uh, <clears throat> we've been able to get away with that for a while. Um, but it was generally considered impossible uh, to have perennialism and high seed yield. Uh, the idea was it comes from a famous formula that had been developed first with clutch size and birds that a plant will either allocate its resources to roots or allocate them to seeds, but it won't be able to do both. And uh, so there's the idea of a physiological trade-off. Well, <clears throat> um, I looked at the roots as an investment, uh, not a cost. And then like the annuals, they gotta do roots every year. 
And so uh, what's this idea about a trade-off? So um, that uh, we've been now, we have some 37 staff at the Land Institute. In the summers, we have <coughs> 40 or so. <coughs> and so here is David Van Tassel, who is working with sunflowers and also a crop called silpium, a new uh, a wild <coughs> species that we that's related to the sunflowers. And um, he's made some wonderful discoveries. And in fact, in the domestication of that crop came a great insight uh, <coughs> that um, uh, I'll be telling you about later. The um, <coughs> Stan Cox working on perennial sorghum. Uh, the perennial sorghum is now in Africa. We have a postdoc from Uganda. It's in uh, some five countries now in Africa. And um, he continues to do breeding for here in the uh, crops here in the United States. Uh, Lady Hahn, we hired to work on developing perennial wheat. And he was crossing perennial wheat with a wild relative from um, the Middle East, from the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And uh, he, as he was making these crosses with the wheat, he was also trying to increase the seed yield within intermediate wheat grass. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you a picture of intermediate wheat grass in just a moment. But uh, <clears throat> we've now called that plant Kernza. And this flower that I gave Dean and John Cobb, if you're out there, I got a package for you too. Uh, <clears throat> this um, particular plant um, is he's, the response to selection has been so thank you, it's been so um, um, dramatic that Lee then we just put him to uh, continue to work on increasing the yield within intermediate wheat grass, and we hired then Xuan Wong to work on the perennial wheat. So I'm going to um, show you a photograph now. The wheat plant at uh, the, the top, that is the species that started civilization uh, some 10 to 12,000 years ago at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, probably came out of the Zagros Mountains of western Iran. That is the number one crop of the world in terms of acreage. It's number two in terms of total calories. Number one happens to be rice. Below is a relative uh, that we were crossing that Lee DeHaan was crossing with the wheat. And by the way, this is actual size, folks, of both of them. Um, below is the intermediate wheat grass that uh, we have been developing and represents the first species that we think we'll be putting out on a widespread basis. It's lots of it's growing in uh, northern Iowa, southern Minnesota. It's uh, being turned into beer and whiskey, we start with basics, and, uh, and uh, it's also Patagonia is making uh, various foods out of it. So uh, uh, thank you folks, you can put that down. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, what we, what we also have uh, um, is Xu En Wang, who is working on the perennial wheat, crossing annual wheat with uh, various species. Uh, uh, this is Xu En again, and the greenhouse. All, we make all wheat pollinations in the greenhouse. And then we're supporting the perennialization of the upland rice in China, and actually some significant breakthroughs on that. Uh, and there's now even talk of perennializing the paddy rice. Uh, so uh, this is our colleague 
in um, uh, Yunnan pro uh, province of China. And then th this is our ecologist and the director of research, Tim Cruz. His job is to start putting these together because if we stop with perennial monocultures, we've missed half the point. What we want are the efficiencies that we find within the natural ecosystem. We're mindful that the ecosystem is the conceptual tool uh, for all of this. So um, it seems to be catching on. We have numerous connections around the world with various institutions. Um, so when we talk about the institutionalization of the research agenda, we can point to various faculty in various places around the globe. Minnesota on Kernza, University of Georgia on Sorghum, Texas A&M Sorghum, South Dakota, Sunflower and Silphium, Shuin, uh, Shuin's uh, hybrids on wheat are in eight different countries, 21 different sites around the world. Uh, the University of Manitoba, Australia on wheat, Uganda, and, um, and four other countries. I mentioned China on rice, there's Mali, Ethiopia. And the, some of the best news is that the National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council, has validated the importance of perennials, so has the Royal Society, the FAO in Rome, uh, has invited our people there. There were some 28 there last uh, a year ago in April, and um, uh, uh, three of them were our folk, and most of the germplasm that, was, that the researchers have been dealing with had come from us. Uh, the World Bank has visited a couple of times, and now the next meeting in September of FAO will be in Mali, and some three or four of us will be there. So uh, that's, it's... It's the breeding work um, has been moving right along when I said 50 to 100 years. Well, we're a little ahead of schedule. So, but now, now for a big story. Uh, we have always had the question, the big question, why did our ancestors not develop perennial grains? Was it success with the annuals? Surely the question was asked thousands of times over the millennia, why must we plow every year and hoe and be bothered by thistles and thorns and suffer from the sweat of the brow? Why? And I'm sure I'm, I'm, well, my bet is that every century there were numerous people that would see what they thought was a promising perennial for grain in Asia and in Africa and in Southern Europe and the Middle East and thought, let's start breeding that. Let's collect seed from the biggest, we will grow them out, and, <clears throat> and we won't have to be suffering from the th thistles and thorns and the sweat of the brow. <clears throat> so I won't go into the four steps, which led to an insight of three of our scientists. But here, I'll do the best I can to keep this um, um, not very, I don't want it to be too technical. Here's the story. Annuals tend to self, that is, accept their own pollen. That is the tightest form of inbreeding. So if a mutation arises and it's lethal, it'll get quickly eliminated because there'll be a doubling up in a hurry. If a desirable trait, like resistance to shatter, for the seed to shatter so we can harvest, and that arises, then it gets quickly selected. If some <coughs> squirrely looking plants, ugly plants, whatever, 
develop, <clears throat> who's going to be interested in those kind of mutants? So the term genetic load or mutational load. Our folks have figured out, first of all, that it's not a problem of perennialism and high seed yield being mutually exclusive. That is a physiological trade-off. <clears throat> it's a genetic problem. And what they have done, instead of growing the plants together, ordinarily we have what we call a head row where you take the seeds from one head, you lay them out, you look at it, and you're looking at the sort of average response overall. But they started spacing them out and giving each plant a chance to express itself. And out of some 2,000 plants, they found two. Not only were they high seed yielding, but they were generally more vigorous overall. So we now know how to purge that genetic load, partly because we can grow out thousands, tens of thousands of plants, and we also have the modern computational power and the knowledge of modern genetics to be, to bring to our understanding. Our ancestors could not have done that even within the last century. So a, <clears throat> a combination of modern molecular tools, the ability to grow out a lot, computational power, and the, uh, the, and the knowledge. And so knowing that, I gave a lecture over at Missouri Botanical Garden and also uh, St. Louis University. And I was saying we need to do a global inventory from the tropics to the temperate zones. Any wild, perennial, hard-seeded plant of the grass family, the legume family, and the sunflower family, we need to have an inventory. Well, I can tell you the staff at Missouri Botanical Garden went nuts. And they said, our computers are tied to all the major botanical gardens of the world and also the major herbaria. We can do that inventory. And so we struck a deal and for a price of a mere half a million dollars over a three-year period, spread over a three-year period, <clears throat> that inventory is now about to get underway. So now I can imagine scores or hundreds of graduate students and postdocs beginning to domesticate various wild candidates. I can imagine food science, food chemistry getting uh, involved. In fact, they're already involved with uh, our crops that are already uh, on their way. So several times, President Thomas Jefferson wrote of the importance of new plants being added to our then new country. I want to quote him in three different places, from three different places. The greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. He also said, I have always thought that if in the experiments to introduce or to communicate new plants, one species in a hundred is found useful and succeeds, the 99 found otherwise are more than paid for. Now he was thinking of introduction into the country. He wasn't thinking about new ones coming on. But then he said, finally, the most targeted statement of all, the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture, especially a bread grain. Well, what does this mean 
now in our time, and I want you to look at the history um, of um, domestication. And I hope you can read that. Are you able to read that, folks? No? Oh, I'm sorry. Boy, I should. Well, let me tell you that in here we have, uh, just to point out, the most recent new species added to the human inventory was 3,500 years ago. And that was cacao. Wheat was some 10,000 years ago, and so on. So uh, this is a listing of, um, of, the various, um, of the various crops on the inventory. So now for the second part of the story. These new species being perennial means we will be adding new and forgive me for using this term, new hardware to grain agriculture. The old annual grain hardware has always limited the potential of the kind of software we have used for 10,000 years. That software is called agronomy how to deal with the reality of the annual hardware. So since one has to tear the ground up every year or drench with an herbicide for starters, in the case of the annual hardware, the new hardware, meaning the perennial, now makes it possible to draw on a new source of software and where does it come from? For 150 years, we have been adding and putting on the shelf ecology and evolutionary biology, the way natural ecosystems work. They have been largely unavailable in any sort of robust way for annuals. But now with the perennials that are going to stay put, those processes that we have understood, come to understand uh, during this century and a half of ecology and evolutionary biology, those processes can come off the shelf and be available to agricultural researchers for grain production. That's big. So in our time, an ecosystem-based agriculture will allow not only more processes in nature's ecosystems to be captured and begin to appear on the agricultural landscape of the world from the tropics to temperate zones, there's something even more important awaiting us. But before I get into that, we can now imagine moving more aggressively away uh, in, in our movement to be more, uh, move more aggressively away from annual monocultures to perennial polycultures for grain production. We can think about ecological intensification. And that was the meeting we hosted at Estes Park of some, it was actually some 50 scientists from around the world that mostly young. And uh, they came from FAO, the UN in Rome, from Argentina, Australia, Canada, China, Ethiopia, Italy, Mali, South Africa, and Sweden. They came together and they went into workshops for their various species and then they begin to talk about how we can begin to think about bringing the various species together. So <clears throat> if we can keep ourselves fed, we can get through this long dark tunnel. What does the future look like for agriculture? Well, I think we can now talk about the end of soil erosion the end of fossil fuel dependency, greatly reduced use of chemicals we've not evolved with, 
more eyes to acres, watching more people with the psychology of a 19th century uh, naturalist, and the end of thistles and thorns and sweat of the brow. So in addressing the title of this talk, Ecological Agriculture for an Ecological Civilization, what we are addressing is a corollary of the ecological worldview as counter to the industrial mind. And rather than ask, how would such an agriculture fit into an ecological civilization. Say that again. Rather than ask how would such an agriculture fit into an ecological civilization, how about rephrasing the statement uh, and come back to the late friend Chuck Washburn who said, if we don't get sustainability in agriculture first, it's not going to happen. And agriculture, which uses nature as the standard or measure is drawing on the discipline of ecology and the material sector, the industrial sector has no discipline to draw on. So as we seek to have agriculture come into phase with nature's standard, become more isomorphic with it, what can we expect as offering for society generally? tight nutrient cycling, short feedback loops become a metaphor. Short feedback loops, the local. The internal, here's a second one. The internal control of a system is more energy and materials efficient than the external control of a system. And we have that example with the rhizosphere bacteria in the root that <clears throat> gives us uh, nitrogen fertility, <clears throat> the most, <clears throat> Vaclav Smil says, the authority on um, anhydrous ammonia says that Haber-Bosch process in 1909 was the most important invention of the 20th century. Natural gas is the feedstock. Without that, 40% of humanity would not be here today. And so now we can imagine biological nitrogen fixation within herbaceous, perennial, seed producing polycultures as the solution to all marital problems and the end of the possibility of nuclear holocaust. <clears throat> the rhizomium bacterium in the legume operates at four fifths of one atmosphere and at ambient temperatures, Haber-Bosch using natural gas is done at 350 atmospheres of pressure and 400 degrees Celsius. That is an, e those, an example of an efficiency that's inherent within the natural integrities of an ecosystem and helps explain Chris Field's understanding of how it is or his discovery that essentially all of nature's ecosystems have greater net primary production than the human managed systems that follow. So, so we can now think of the law of return described by Sir Albert Harp, uh, Howard, how that speaks to the nature of recycling. And, and finally I give this one little example, my friend um, uh, Jack Ewell, ecologist, Florida, with his students, I think in Costa Rica, where they were doing slash and burn. And in an area that had been cleared, Jack and his students substituted vine for vine, tree for tree, shrub for shrub. They always brought in plants that would, could not have got there on their own but by mimicking the structure, they were granted the function. So there it is. These systems that have evolved over millions of years that we started plowing up 10,000 years ago at the end, eastern end of the Mediterranean. And by the way, I think this is a really important point. 
in order for us to get a seed bed to accommodate that annual grain, nature had to be subdued or ignored. And that idea has ricocheted through civilization and has given us the dualism that we now have in the modern world. It didn't start with the Greeks or the Hebrews, even though the dualism is there. But now we can begin to think of the end of that dualism. So uh, I'll end with Gary Snyder poem, which appeared at the end of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Turtle Island. It's called For the Children. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next century, or the one beyond that, they say, our valleys, pastures, we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children, stay together, learn the flowers, go light. We at the Land Institute are contributing to that hump those rising hills with our technology, our pickup trucks, <clears throat> our tractors, our greenhouse, our computers. The technology makes this possible. Will all that technology use to bring these new species and varieties into existence be required on the other side? And I say the answer is no. Their creatureliness will still be there. And that will make them available even to a, a Neolithic farmer. The industrial world cannot make that claim. So we have answered two of the old religious questions. Where do we come from? We're products of the Simeon line, but the carbon which enters so importantly in our bodies was cooked in the remote past of a dying star and from it came nitrogen and oxygen. And these spewed out into space to form planets and we ourselves. And we know that the ancient seas set the pattern of ions in our blood. George Wald talked about this years ago. The ancient atmospheres molded our metabolism. So what kind of a thing are we? Where do we come from? What kind of a thing are we? We've answered those two questions. The big question is, what's to become of us? So we were promised a new heaven and a new earth. Astrophysics has given us the new heaven. And it's up to us to come up with the new earth. And in one sense, we're like Dante, entering a dark wood. There is neither map nor guide. Dante had Virgil for the trip through hell. In our time, we're all hoping to avoid several kinds of hell as we make our way through the woods. Or if you prefer, maybe what we're inning is more desert-like, but with no Moses or commandments in stone. It matters but little that we have neither map nor guide, however, my friends. We have something better. We have affection for our ecosphere and the will to negotiate a corrective course. We have our institutions, our schools, our colleges, our universities, our nonprofits, even governments to transform and use. Agriculture and the formal culture have historically stood behind cultural advances and declines, but so has, for all practical purposes, non-renewable carbon. It hasn't mattered whether the operating system of ideas featuring gods or God, the divine right of kings, private property, or universal human rights. As land animals, our land, depace, land based dependency is always in the thinking. T.S. Eliot's Little Gidding. We shall not cease from exploration 
And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So far, we have only colonized our ecosphere. Its discovery is before us, but we're on our way. Thank you. You, ha you have spoken, and those are the most important words to respond to Wes Jackson. But we have two panelists who are going to offer us their words in response. Thank you very much. Very briefly, uh, I want to ask my colleague uh, Christopher uh, if he would uh, share with us from his perspective of working all over the world on these things, uh, your response to what Wes has said. Thank you. Oh, you're big. I work for World Vision, and World Vision is an organization that works around the world on emergency humanitarian response, in economic and social development, and in advocacy issues. And we have a saying among some of us that we never want to let a good emergency go without wringing everything good from it. We began this conference with Bill McKibben who spoke of the uh, catastrophe we are looking at, staring at, and actually living right now with regard to climate change. There are 500 million smallholder farmers around the world, most of whom depend upon rain-fed uh, agricultural practices. And one of the dominant changes that we're seeing around the world because of climate change is that those rainfall patterns, those precipitation patterns, uh, are now in flux. They cannot be depended upon. What is the solution for 500 million farmers, 2 billion people, many of whom are the poorest people on this planet? In our experience and from the things that we have been working on, we have seen that the part of the answer to that is to work with a smallholder farmer in a number of realities of their life. One is much of their practice is simply uh, inadequate to, to earn a significant income. Without income, one cannot earn and build the financial capital needed to respond to shocks. Second, however, is that if we're going to build improved and resilient livelihoods for smallholder farmers, we have to be looking at the farm not only as a business, which it is, but also at the farm as an ecosystem within a larger ecosystem. And the third piece being that we need to also make sure that they're aware of and able to respond to the information about what is changing around them. But what we've seen from Wes and what we've heard from Wes uh, is getting to one of the critical pieces. The most resilient ecosystem is the one that is most intact. How are the soils of the Sahel being impacted right now by agricultural practice, where the Sahelian farmers were told by Canadian, American, uh, European, uh, uh, agriculturalists to cut down all the trees when the Sahel is created to work with trees in the farming system. How is it that the smallholder farmers of East Africa uh, are to practice agriculture when they cannot count on the rains? 
I think the answer is what we've heard from Wes. Uh, and Wes has offered us, as he said, and I want to echo that, a path forward, a very real way to change the dynamic for smallholder farmers. This is not simply a response to climate change, but climate change has given us the chance, the impetus, and in fact the, the, the demand that we move seriously on the issues of the smallholder farmer, many of whom again are living in poverty. Can we seize this opportunity? Uh, Wes, I think that the, the answer is an absolute and resounding yes. Now is the time when we need the work that you've been doing for years. a while. Half a century? I won't, I can't count that high. Um, to, to come to the fore and, and play its proper role. Is it the time to do that? Is this just, uh, uh, I would say a young man, but I, my chronology doesn't allow me to say that accurately anymore. Is this just somebody, somebody from World Vision saying this is time to get moving because the, these are the people we work with? No, the world has committed billions of dollars to the issues the smallholder farmer is facing. Um, the, uh, in the climate negotiations, we have got firm commitments for hundreds of billions of dollars for climate change adaptation. It is beginning to flow. Uh, we have seen the creation of the Green Climate Fund. We have seen in uh, World Vision and others have created the Africa Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance, looking for the triple win of improving productivity and, and incomes, resilience, and dragging the carbon that's already in the atmosphere out of the atmosphere and keeping it sequestered. So now is the time, Wes, for you to join a large movement to push the movement. The time is right. Can we build and can we use ecological agriculture for an ecological civilization? Yes, the time is now. The time is ripe to move. The time has come for West Jackson to play a leading role in how we transform agriculture around the world. So Wes, I thank you for your work and I thank you for what we're gonna do together. Let's go do it. Good morning, everyone. Gansai, what you want? Wis Tikushin de Yanjiang. Jingwa Chi Tenda Hui Yi. What Hono Dong Fu Xian to say Yang Yi Gai Nian. Women Ru Hu Zhou Xiang Shentai Renin. Would you the woman Zhou Xiang Shentai Renin Shi Yi Gai Nian? Zhu Gai Nian. Chu Women Zhu Hui Yi Lai Yang. 我觉得浮现出三个非常重要的概念。第一个是新能源革命。Uh, after listening uh, resection, Dr. Resection's lecture and also other keynote speech speakers, I got a lot of wonderful idea in my mind. 第二个革命呢是农业革命，这就是刚才齐克春所讲的这个革命。According uh, to my understanding. Ecological civilization is a really revolution. First is a energy revolution. Second is a agricultural revolution. The third one is a is a south revolution. Change our mindset. These three revolutions is an organic whole. 呃，刚才呃季克春所讲的这个农业革命，我觉得给我一个最大的启发就是，我们需要以一种全新的思维和哲学来认识土地、认识农业。What inspired me most from West's lecture is that we should use a new way of thinking to revalue, to re, to receive. Our value to the land, to the nature. Uh, 现在我们的农业是以工业的思维的范式来解决它的。工业的思维范式，它是把 
，机器看成一个不动的地方，人才是动，人不动，机器就不动。但是，我们的农业不是这样，我们面对的大自然。它是一个具有自主之自动的系统，生生不息。我们不动，它也在动。这是非常两个本质不同的系统。The modern mechanical thinking treats nature, land, as something stable, dead, dead thing, but the organic thinking treats it as something living. Living organism is always in process. 为什么我们的工业化农业的技术走走向了死胡同？就在于我们，为什么工业化的这个技术走向了死胡同？就在于我们是以机械的、认识机械的这种思维方式来解决这个生生不息的系统。Why modern civilization go to dead end? Because we use such kind of mechanical thinking. 所以说，刚才杰克逊所讲的这一个农业的技术突破。我认为它首先是一个哲学和思维的突破。What Jackson's reform is a kind of philosophical revolution. 我觉得我要谈的第二个观点，我作为来自于中国，中国是一个农业大国。其实我们今天也需要重新解读农业生产方式的过程。I come from China. China is the big country of agricultural country. Today, China also need to use this kind of organic thinking. 工业生产的财富，它的财富只是结果财富，只有生产结果完成的时候，财富才能形成。And the the production, the 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 wealth also the result of production. 但是农业的财富生产过程，它是有首先有过程财富，然后也有结果财富。But that is the industrial wealth. But the agricultural wealth is both the process and the result. 任何一个农民在从事农业生产的过程中，他在这个过程本身就是一个一个生命与另外一个生命对话的过程。When a farmer do the organic farming, that is the interaction between one life with another life. 这个过程就像一个艺术家进行画画一样，是一个充满艺术和智慧的过程。Like a painter painting a, a, a painting is the process of a, a journey, adventure. 但是我们现代的农业经济和农业理论把这个过程全部中断了。But our modern agriculture totally interrupts this living process. 我们把它改造为一个没有过程、只有结果的像工业一样的系统。We transform this process into just the result. 按照这一个模式，在今天的中国也在进行着这种按照工业模式改造农业模式的过程。This kind of industrial agriculture right now is become quite influential in China. 这个改造的过程就是要把农业生产过程中延伸出的乡村文明、乡村文化、乡村智慧，是它没有存在的必要。This kind of uh, uh, industrial agriculture destroys our royal civilization. So, due to this reason, I'm in the United States. I'm in the United States. I'm working on a project to protect and preserve the Chinese culture and language. But uh, my, I and my colleagues right now in China we are promoting the royal civilization. Want to save the agricultural uh, civil, uh, civilization. 呃，围绕这个问题呢，我们我给大家最最后再再讲一句话。呃，我们已经召开了三届、两届中国乡村文明发展论坛，第三届中国乡村文明发展论坛将在今年的十月份举行，举行，希望我们大家能够参加。One more word. Right now, we so far we have already the organized the uh three times the forum on a uh on rural civilization in this coming October. We are going to hold the third one. All of you are welcome to join us. 最后，感谢大会，感谢科普博士和王博士邀请我们参加这个大会。Again, I want to express my deep thanks to Dr. Cobb, to this conference, to Dr. Wang, myself.
It's fascinating to see uh, the vision that has been created at the Land Institute is now a part of a global vision, including China. Uh, Wes, thank you. Uh, words cannot express our gratitude and our responsibility. We've, we've confronted an awesome model of it, what's involved in seizing an alternative. And our task for the rest of this conference and beyond is to continue the kind of conversation that we've just started. To lead us in our closing is the conference poet laureate, Pat Patterson. I could have read about seed theft by Monsanto. I could have read about the atrocious pig farming in Iowa, but instead I want to end with Precious Planet. Dear Precious Planet, amazing earth we've evolved to live on, glorious home we've been created to care for, our hearts leap with thanksgiving when we consider your intricacies, your beauties, your promise, your ever awesome miracles. From microcosm to macrocosm, from deepest seas to highest peaks, from tiniest microbe to hugest mammal, from acorn to massive oak, from tiniest seed to sprouting forth of new life. Your winds and rains, your snows and sun showers, your ways of feeding us and watering us, your provisions for sheltering us and clothing us, your inviting us to accompany others, in fact, to recognize how so many creatures make our lives possible, inside and out, seen and unseen partners in totally connected being. How splendid is our home, this blesses, blessed gift of here life in this tiny corner of immense universe. How can we be truly worthy of your cradling us when our ways have grown so far from your ways, when we lo no longer celebrate but often desecrate our miraculous mother. Help us now, before it is too late, to be fully part of you, co-creating and redeeming our one and only home our wide and wondrous family. I'll remind you that right after this session, Wes Jackson will be signing books, so please join him, and he will greet you with a smile and a signature. We now close this time together with gratitude. Someone once said of John Cobb that his doctoral students were not as good as he thought they were. They, his friend said, for John Cobb, all of his geese are swans. Now there are limits to that metaphor because geese are precious animals as much as swans. But you get the point. John Cobb is a great appreciator of the community in which he lives. He sees the best in each one of us, and he expects the best not just from himself, but from all of us, individually and together. So as we go forth from this conference, 
we go forth proudly as swans. But much more important than that, as we go forth from this conference, we go forth as part of Pando Populus, this giant ancient plant connected at the roots, prepared to give life back into the world and to serve this planet so that this planet might survive. So let us close first with thanks. Thanks to Pat Patterson, awesome. Thanks to Wes Jackson, awesome. Thanks and chia chia to the panel, awesome. And thanks to the powerful pickers who will lead us in our closing music before I invite you to hold a moment in silence to give your thanks with a deep breath of gratitude. Thanks to that which we name as holy, and thanks to you. Will you please stand as we conclude this session? And uh, thanks to the uh, Chinese delegates who are sponsoring the second ecological civilization international so who have blessed the pickers with special t-shirts which are also available to you for the rest of the day which on them say i'm on the green road and rather than a humvee there's a bicycle <laughs> the other thing is that the last of the uh, cds and songbooks have been brought over uh, from the bookstore and are also uh, in the lobby uh, for your purchase. Well, let's sing a song that was written specifically for this conference, uh, which is a take on um, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? And we call it Where Have All the Green Fields Gone? Please join us in singing. Oh.
dollars swished and gone. Long time passing. Well, we're relearning it today, are we not? Where has all earth's wisdom gone? Not so long ago. Where has all earth's wisdom gone? Seek it now to carry on. So may we ever learn. So may we instrumental. sing with me. The colors of the rainbow. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of the people going by. I see friends shaking hands saying, how you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear